members here at Hearts for Pike, it's always a delight to look out and see guests with us. Some of you are here because we invited you, your family, friends, maybe a co-worker or a classmate, and it means a lot that you took up our invitation. Others of you just uh, wandered in, maybe you're new to the community, have a dozen different reasons for being here, but uh, please know it means a lot that you're here. Love to have you back tonight at 5 o'clock, our next opportunity. The sermon is either going to be about Stephen Russell or Stephen Russell's preaching. And I think you know that uh, Stephen is our guest. It's been a while since he's spoken and look forward to great lesson from the Word of God. We had a great friends and family day last week. I say that not because I was in the middle of it. Uh, sickness kind of uh, hit me real quick Saturday and uh, had to watch the service. Thankful for uh, the internet and, and being able to live stream it. But I uh, wish I could have been here with you. I want to thank all who had a part in preparation beforehand and doing a lot of things during and then even after to, to make it a, a special day. I heard great comments about Brother David Lyons' lesson. Glad uh, that he could be here. Tomorrow night, this is not on the announcement sheet, but uh, home improvement at our house at 630. That is with an asterisk, baby Jarrett uh, permitting. We're still not grandparents yet. Uh, all of you are looking to see what's going on, but uh, about nine days out from the due date, we know it could be any time, so we'll let you know if that has to be postponed, but uh, Pray for Brianne and Austin uh, during this time and us as well. If you see Sandra jump up and, and start uh, whirling about, you probably know she's getting a text in the middle of the sermon. And I have specific instructions about what to do if that happens. So uh, we'll, we'll see what, uh, how our timing is today. We're looking at a topic seriously from the Word of God about equality. This is a great buzzword in our society today. I want to look at what the Bible says and, and a godly perspective that ought to be behind everything that we discuss. Is God pro-equality and what do we mean by that? And is it always in, in the way that sometimes the world looks at? You might have seen a bumper sticker on cars as I have with, with that equal sign or maybe shirts or other advertisements about that. People talk about and discuss equality in different ways. There are people standing up for racial equality and economic equality and even gender equality. How that the sexes, male and female, no distinction, even in wages. There are many people in economic equality that kind of takes us back to our text here that say, you know what, everybody ought to have the same amount of money. There should be no rich and poor, and, and we need equality that way. Maybe not thinking through all the ramifications of, of things like that. One of the, the specific ways in which we're encouraged toward equality is marriage equality the idea that, that homosexuals and even polygamous, uh, polygamous marriages are great and part of a progressive culture. And, and we need to get with the times and, and be very, uh, very eager to advocate any type of equality that the world dictates there. Now let's go back to that text in Matthew chapter 20. The laborers in the vineyard there. Remember how this son, very early crack of dawn, basically around working. And they, uh, they put in about 12 good hours. But through the day, at different hours kind of staggered. The master needing more workers goes out and finds those in the marketplace. And enlists them to help. And basically says, at the end of the day, I'll pay you. He didn't even name the, the wage. I'll pay you what's fair. At the end of the day, all the workers, some that are just beat down, tired from having worked a, literally half a day, Versus those whose uh, you know, clothes are nice, haven't hardly broken a sweat, they just worked one hour. God gives the, the longest workers a denarius, common day's wage. But to the surprise of a lot of folks, the ones who had worked just a part of a day, even maybe more than half a day, they got a denarius. And here the, the one hour workers get the very same wage as all the others, and they complain about that. They voice their displeasure to the master, to the landowner about that. And they say, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who've borne the burden and the heat of the day. And the master basically says, hey, I, I haven't done anything wrong. It may not be fair to you. It may not be equality, but, but I've done what I told you I would do. And by the way, this parable isn't about socialism. It isn't about economics anyway, but... He's foreshadowing a time in which the Gentiles would be equal heirs with the Jews. These Johnny-come-latelys, the Jews would be all up in arms about that. That's not right. Yet God says, I am fair. I am equal in what I do. If you want to take notes, 2 Corinthians 8, 13 and 14, 
has Paul writing to the church there, and he's urging them to be eager to fulfill what they promised earlier. We're going to help with some financial relief to the poor saints. And he actually kind of shames them. He says, you know what? Some folks that are poorer than you are, they've already given. And before that, you who are in a better position to help, you, you pledged that you would, but you've been dragging your feet. Let's make it equal again. They've helped already, so you supply what is lacking. And so there may be an equality. 2 Corinthians 8, 13 and 14. Again, not exactly our purpose for, for what we're talking about here. I think as we look at equality, the way the world uses it and the way that many progressives are framing it, it's, it's very different. And I believe that the devil delights in causing confusion in everything, and he delights in the delusion that is going on in the world today. Let me call upon our young folks that are still with me to, to help me out with some simple math equations here. Anybody know what one plus one is? If you would take your little pencil and, and write it invisible, two right there, you'd be right on target, wouldn't you? One plus one isn't three, and one plus one isn't 0.999 or 1.99, anything like that. There is a very fixed and definite answer to the question. If you took fractions, didn't you like those in school? And don't you like them, young folks? But one-third plus two-thirds, what is that? It's one, isn't it? It's that .3333 with a little line over it, plus .6666, infinity, uh, infinity, and so all that equals one, doesn't it? Einstein had a famous equation. I never took physics, thankfully, but uh, it's this idea uh, of the equality. He found a, a principle that that is still used. I guess some have tried to tweak it or, or maybe refine it somewhat, but the E equals MC squared. That's mass times the speed of light squared. I'm not going to go into a physics lecture at all, but these are equal things. We have an acknowledged that mathematical, even, even physical laws are unyielding. They are what they are. They will yield a finite result. And, and I ask the question, why would moral laws not be the same way? A lot of people uh, today are rethinking and revisiting and deciding, you know, everything that we said is equal in the past isn't so. And so we need to, to be more liberal in, in our interpretations and all that. I don't know that I've ever quoted Aristotle in a sermon, but he has something worthwhile to say a long time ago, and it was along this line. May need help up top there. The worst form of inequality is to try to make unequal things equal. I read that and I thought, wow, that, that's great. I, I wish people had the insight and the forethought to think about that. There is such a thing as equality. Great, I want to know what that is. But, but making unequal things equal is not anything good. In fact, he says it's the worst form of it. Just pronouncing something equal does not make it so. And how we need to, to think about the, the implications of something simple like that. Let's go a different direction here. I'm going to go everywhere preaching the word today. I want to think about God with you. And I want to say something that is fundamental not only to this lesson, but about anything and everything we ever do. As I think about equality, I need to know something, that there is a God. I need to know who he is. I need to know what he is defined as equal and what he said by the same token is unequal there. Help me out as we look at a little more text on the screen here. As I think about the different things that people are saying today about what is equal, you know what? Do you have any problem with these? Are, are you prepared to say that all of these things are equal? Don't talk about fat or skin anymore. In fact, I, I personally feel pretty good about that one. But are we going to say that these are all the same? We're rethinking everything and everything's topsy-turvy. And so what is in is now out. And truth is the same thing as error. And Jehovah equals Allah up and down. So, and so forth and so on. A lot of people would say, well, you know what, um, I, I see some things I would agree with there. I see some things that, that really don't seem equal, and it's not a matter of getting enough heads lined up and saying, hey, that's the very same thing. You don't change opposites. You don't make things of contrast to be the very same just because that you say that they are, do you? Here's another list of things. I wonder if you would say that these are all equal, gay and straight. A lot of people say, yeah, no, no problem there. Stupid is the same thing as smart. And that long and short and tall, are they all equal there, day and night, young and old, tolerant and intolerant? As you think about that list, and, and is there true equality there? You know what, in Job 31, 
verse 13 through 15, Job says, If I despise the cause of my male or female servant when they complained against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? Job says there's an equality between me and my servants. I realize we came from the same place there. So in a sense, yes. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 2, the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. But here's a little bit of a twist on that. Looking at these things, some of them that the world says are equal, some of them by common sense we know are not and never can be really equal. I would ask a question. Does inequality mean better or worse? If I say that these things aren't equal, is that elevating one? Is it giving a, a higher standing to, to one over the other? And I would follow that up with this. If these things, at least some of them are unequal, how are they unequal? Is it in quality? Is it in quantity? Or is it in something else? Listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Isaiah goes on to say, Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute or are confused bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah, what are you asking? What are you saying there? That just because I say something is equal doesn't make it equal. That was true, friends, 2,500, 2,600 years ago. It hadn't changed. Things are still different. And sometimes it's not for me to say, well, now one's better or worse. You know what? If I weigh 300 pounds, I am heavy by the world's definition, right? There are certain things I can't do. Some things I'd be well suited to do. If I'm a football player, and I'm athletic, there's a place for me on an offensive or defensive line. I can just about give up being a jockey, riding a horse, or being a gymnast. And you know what? If you're five foot nothing and you weigh 90-something pounds, don't you dream about being a pro basketball player. But you could be a great jockey. You might be a world-class gymnast. You're different. One is not necessarily better or, or uh, superior to the other just because you're different. And yet... There again, when we lump all the differences together, the skin color and country and educational opportunities and income and all that, and suggest that just as surely as those aren't right or wrong, that I can't always know that certain things that the world condones now are right and wrong either. Let me go back to what I mentioned just a moment ago. In discussions like this, it is so important to realize what is at the heart of it. Number one, I need to realize that I have this perspective. It is an unashamed position of mine. There is a God, and this God is knowable, and this God is eternal. He is absolute. He is perfect. And my God's laws are fixed. They don't bend. They don't change over time. They're not in flux. And these laws that God has given, we may break them or say that we break them. Actually, we're broken on them. If I decide there is no God, or if I want a stripped-down version of, of God as he's designed himself, I have hurt myself. I have chosen a position that is, that is untenable there. I can't have a fruitful position with the person, or conversation rather, with the person that says there's not a God. Take him out of this discussion about equality. I, I can't help it. That is where I come from. That's how that everything is seen. That's the filter through all of these discussions here. He's the ultimate one. And so if you disagree with that, if you think I'm all washed up, well, you know what? We're going to have to agree to disagree and it'll all be sorted out in the day of judgment. Let me tell you what God says about himself. God says, I have no equal, strictly speaking. In Exodus 20, he said, you shall have no other gods before me. Balaam says something about God in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. He's not the son of man that he should repent. God's different. Angels aren't God. Satan isn't God. Little g, gods aren't God. Isaiah 40, 25. To whom then would you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? 
Lift up your eyes on high and see who's created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. God didn't stutter, did he, when he said that I am unique, I'm different, nothing else, no one else like me. A little bit later in Isaiah chapter 46, 4 and 5, take up with me where God says, even to your old age, I am he, and even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made, and I will hear, even I will carry and will deliver you. The question again, to whom will you liken me and make me equal? Compare me that we should be alike. The applied answer is no one. No one. In John chapter 5, Jesus makes a startling claim, one that was considered blasphemous to his contemporaries. He talks about my father has been working until now. I have been working. And the Jews sought to kill him, not only because he broke the Sabbath, but notice that he said God was his father, making himself equal with God. That is a very ironic statement to me. Jesus made himself equal with God. It wasn't because he said it. There was something beyond the claim. You see, all the way back in Philippians 2, God had a plan for us. And that plan included Jesus leaving heaven. And Jesus was made equal with us. Jesus did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be held on to. He emptied himself coming and living among us and living as one of us. You know what they said about Jesus? Among some of the criticisms in uh, Matthew 11, Matthew 12, he is doing these miracles. He's casting out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And Jesus says, that's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard, my interpretation Why in the world would the ruler of the demons work against himself? Why would he do something that would harm himself? That doesn't make sense. See, Jesus is not a demon, and he's not the ruler of the demons, but he is God. And this God and this Son and the Holy Spirit, for good measure, are the ones in the words of Acts 17, 26, who made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, determine their pre-appointed times, and the boundaries of their habitation. When we talk about equality, understand that really when it comes to skin color, God says, I made all of them. They're mine. I didn't elevate one. I didn't subjugate one. All human beings are mine. God has always been pro-racial equality. Can you believe that? We haven't always understood it, but but it's the truth. There was a fellow named uh, Nicholas Chauvin. He was a legendary French soldier who was fiercely loyal to France. We get a word borrowed from him, chauvinism. And chauvinism, while it is usually applied to male chauvinism, the idea that supposedly males are superior to females, it could be on the basis of anything, your your gender, your group, your nation, chauvinism. Is God chauvinistic? Apart from God singling out Israel to be the vehicle, to be the womb in which his son was born, Literally, no. And you come down to the New Testament, you realize there's not a favored nation. There is the sense in which all are to be one in Christ and and with the blessings of God. And yet we see so much inequality. I saw this recently as we think about why there is unfairness in the world. Jewish deli wouldn't serve ham and cheese sandwiches. Muslim wouldn't provide pork to a convention. Atheist baker wouldn't make a Christmas cake with a nativity scene on it. And yet with all that, we understand that there's respect of their religious differences. Christian businesses, however, are supposed to provide flowers and cakes and catering and all that. If you don't, you will be fine. There will be swift punishment given to you. Does that make sense to you? In the minds of a lot of people, that is a wonderful inequality that is being used to help people get it and to get with the program about what what should be the case in this world. God is concerned about true equality. Let us never forget that. I'm going to show you something here in a moment, if I can uh, get this working right. I've got Joe and Jim. Jim is, is right there, and Joe's on the other side. Let's talk about them. Let's use them as an example, if you will. Here to me, and are they equals? Well, yes. Why? Because Acts 17, 26, God made them both. 
He didn't make one to own the other one. didn't make one to have rights or superiority in any way. And so racially, they are equals. As a nation, haven't always understood that, haven't always practiced that. But staying in God's court, in his arena, we can't go wrong when we acknowledge that. Both of them have equal rights, assuming they're American citizens. But let me share something with you here. Now, Joe is the supervisor of Jim at work. Are they equals? Well, they work for the same company, yes. They both draw a wage. It may be different, but Jim has to answer to Joe as a supervisor. But here's another wrinkle here. Jim is an elder in the church where Joe worships. And so, in a sense, Joe has to be subordinate and submissive to him as an elder. Neither one could say, you know what? I am more important than you, either in the church setting or in a business setting. I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to abide by it. There's an inequality here. Both of them are equals, and yet within the sphere that God has given, there is to be a mutual submission in those roles. Suppose that these men, as Christians and as co-workers, decide that they have fallen in love with each other's wives, and they decide to divorce their spouse and marry the other one. You know what? Our country would grant them the right to have that remarriage. In the minds of a lot of people, that, that'd be fine. They're equals. God says, it's not right. Adultery has taken place. You can call it whatever you want to. That's not right. Or what if they both decide, I'm leaving the church. I'm leaving my family. Joe and Jim are attracted to one another. And they go to our law courts and say, for the first year ever in American society, we have the right to be joined in a homosexual union that our country grants us the right and the privilege to enjoy. Are you ready to accept the idea that, you know what, if the courts say it's legal, they're equal, they're no different than any heterosexual couple that might receive a license the same day. We are in that area in which a lot of people, as they are for equality in a lot of other respects, take it another level, take it a direction that God never intended. The Supreme Court is ruled in favor of marriage equality. And so this love wins coast to coast. And the idea that it's all all right. Let's go back to God. Let's ask his question about that. Does he love everybody? Yes, he does. All the different backgrounds and national. Yes, he does. But with that love, has God given parameters for our morality? And absolutely. I had better respect those. You ever seen an image like this? I know it's about a month away from Halloween. These skeletons aren't there for that. But, but some have tried to maybe confuse an issue when they, they say, no, what's wrong with this? You've got a black and a white. And you, you take it all, you get down to where we really are. You've got a gay and a straight, religious and atheist. And there's, what's the difference between any of those? You take the skin off and we're all just the same kind of how the argument goes. There's an equality there. Some have used it to, in a different way. By the way, I, I borrowed these, just found them on the internet there. Some have uh, had a little bit different take, and that is that, that among religions, you've got a Hindu and a Muslim and a Christian, a Buddhist, Sheikh, and a, a Jewish person. You see any difference there? Well, those people, while they were living, or maybe outside the expert, believe and practice different things. But you know what? They're all fundamentally the same. There's an equality there. That makes it right for me to be any of those or none of those and, and it's all okay let me uh, substitute a, a few more qualifiers or descriptors there could you not say that in essence help me out here guys that this uh, person kind of there from left to right you've got a child rapist you've got a serial killer you've got a slave owner there, there's you and me they're kind of in the middle and and you've got an identity thief here and finally a drug lord they look any different to you? No. All down under, are, we're all the same. But, but does that mean that they were all right? That, that there's fundamentally no difference in us. Bob Dylan, that great philosopher, used to say, all this talk about equality, the only thing people really have in common is that they're all going to die. Bob Dylan said that. Bob, in, in a sense, I agree with you. But you know what? There is a big difference. That's not the only difference thing we have in common after death is the biggie because an x-ray is not going to show you a soul none of those reflected on the moral quality what a person did in their life there is much more to us than flesh and bones and all that 
this soul that God planted within you and me is what is answerable to God. And so as I think about equality, a great principle that needs to be talked about, understood within the, the, the parameters, again, the, the borders there where, where it is. Not everything is equal. Does fruit equal fruit? I know you're thinking, well, a banana is not the same thing as an apple or an orange and, and all that. Is everything equal? Back in the Garden of Eden, when God made all of the different trees and then placed Adam and Eve in the garden, remember the, the prohibition, the, the no-no he gave there? You can eat of all the, the fruit of these trees except the fr fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that one. All fruit's not fruit. Some of it, in fact, very little of it forbidden. The rest of it, have at it. Adam and Eve took of the forbidden fruit because it wasn't all the same. And when they did, there were consequences, there were implications, there was a punishment with the effects reaching down even to you and I today in as much as we die. It's not all the same. You couldn't argue that. Adam and Eve wouldn't leave the Garden of Eden saying, hey, there's no biggie. Is water the same as water? If you're naming back in 2 Kings chapter 5 and you got a bad case of leprosy, he goes to Elisha the prophet hoping to be healed. Elisha won't even come out of the house and he's second-guessing himself, and he says, you know what, are not the waters of the Abana and the Farfar, these Syrian rivers, are they not better than this old muddy Jordan River? And his servants kind of calm him down and say, you know what, he's not asked you to do anything major. Dip, how many times? Seven in the Jordan, your flesh will be restored. Is all water the same water? In a way, yes. In Naaman's situation, no. It wouldn't have done it if he dipped seven times there. It wouldn't have worked if it had dipped once, four times, 13, whatever number you want to come up with. It wasn't until the seventh and final time that Naaman, by virtue of his obedience, learned there's a difference in water sometimes. We've got water back here in what we call a baptistry. Isn't that the same water that you'd get anywhere? Did you get it from a special source? Oh, no. But God has singled out water in Galatians 3, 26 and 29. And it says, you're all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Where there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Equality, yes. We enjoy privileges. We enjoy in 2 Peter 1, 1, a like precious faith, a faith of equal standing is how the English Standard Version has that. How do we get there? God says you do it by virtue of submitting to a water that I have singled out for a purpose that is so specific and so liberating here. Isn't it great to, to have the blessings of being in Christ? I hope today I've challenged your thinking. I made you want to to draw close to God, to respect Him in all that you do. If you've not yet named the name of Christ, if you've not been a Christian yet, you can leave here saved, on your way rejoicing, trusting and serving a God who is absolutely perfect in everything that He says. He will not steer us wrong, could not possibly guide us into error. Be thankful for our loving Father who gives us freedom and liberation through Jesus Christ. We encourage your obedience today. While together we stand and sing this song.
in preparation for Lord's Supper, Christ the Lord. Have you ever given a gift? You planned ahead to give somebody something? You went and purchased it? And you were so pleased when you gave that person the gift because you wanted to do it. Have you ever received a gift and told somebody, well, you shouldn't have. But the person said, I wanted to. Christ Jesus gave us a gift, the gift of life beyond this physical body. My question for us to think about is, what are we doing with the gift he's given us? 
that gift came with a price. We didn't have to pay for it. Jesus did with his life. And at this time in our services, we think about what Jesus did in giving his life, physical life, for us. In Mark 14, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you thought about us, that you sacrificed for us, even though we didn't deserve it, that you gave your body to hang on that cross for our sins. Be with us as we partake of this bread that represents that body and help us to realize what you have done for us and help us to work harder for thee. It's through your son that we pray. Amen.